Hello there, everybody. Good afternoon to everybody uh, east of us here in the UK and good morning to those west of us, North American, South American, Central American people joining us. Thank you very much. And um, we're here to do our webinar around the world in 80 paid content strategies. And your presenters today, first off, will be Anna, who is from MPP, and I'll let Anna introduce herself. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. What an awesome response we've had to this webinar topic, obviously very popular um, throughout the publishing industry. Um, my name's Anna Lobb. I work as the VP for Media and Publishing for MPP Global. Um, my specialism is helping publishers increase their subscription revenue, um, and luckily that gives me quite a a good amount of insight into the types of projects from a technology perspective that publishers are working on around the globe. Over to you, Ben. Thanks. I'm Ben Edwards. I'm a director at Page Suite, and similar to Anna, really, I've got the pleasure of working a range of media companies right across the world, helping them deploy and monetize our suite of digital and app solutions. Uh, one day it might be getting an amazing review of our e-paper solution from a former <laughs> president of the United States. The next, it's meeting up with multinational magazine groups launching highly personalised apps, some of which we'll be talking through today. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Um, so just, just a couple of quick housekeeping points um, in terms of webinar controls. Um, you are able to ask questions throughout the webinar, in which case you can either raise your hand or you can type a question into the control panel. Um, the nature of the topic that we've picked, which is 80 paid content um, strategies around the world means that we've got quite a lot to cover. Um, so if we don't stop during each of the slides, we'll certainly come back to your questions towards the end of the webinar. Um, we've also got a poll midway through, so we'd invite you to participate in that. Oh yeah, absolutely, if you can. Um, just, just before we dive in, we'd just like to introduce ourselves and the companies a little bit further. Um, I work for MPP Global. We provide a cloud-based subscription management platform um, to global enterprise um, media and entertainment groups. Um, as you can see from the slide, there's a whole range of brands that work with us and we've got a whole mix um, from on-demand TV clients to publishing clients. And as you can see there, fan engagement has been a huge growth area for us over the last 12 months. So you'll also notice people like um, Formula One, um, Manchester United, um, who are all starting to develop paid content strategies. What does that development mean for you then over the last 12 months? Any new products or features that you've brought to the MPP suite? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a, a big shift for us has been learning across all of the different industries that we work in. Um, obviously, um, TV um, have been miles ahead in terms of monetizing pure play digital content. Um, so there have been a lot of lessons for publishers that come across from our TV and on-demand brands. So that's people like Sky and Now TV. And, yeah. yeah, but what we're also seeing is that a lot of retailers um, are very interested in the recurring revenue model. Um, and what it's meant is the way that we've taken the platform um, over the last 12 months is to start to really focus in on physical product sales, um, whether that's a print subscription, whether that's e-commerce. Um, and it's meant that we've done things like added basket functionality and really extended the bundling capabilities, hopefully um, helping publishers um, expand their brand reach and their, their product revenues. Nice. So Page Suite, um, many of you will be familiar with us. For those that aren't, we've been in business around 12 years, a um, private company. And whether you're a niche brand who wants a simple e-paper solution, right through to a large multinational or multi-title publisher who wants maybe a custom app or live news websites, maybe spin-off branded applications for targeted audiences, or indeed maybe exploring some of the more innovative technologies like Alexa, our new digital edition solution or Kiosk products, and then we are a platform that you can utilize wherever you are. We're truly a 24 seven business with our team operating right around the clock. I feel very much like the original Phileas Fogg, which this webinar is <laughs> named after my global movements. I've got clients as far west as the LA Times on the west coast of the States, right through to a whole time zone away, Fiji Times, where we do their CMS e-paper and apps for the East. Okay, fantastic. So you'll be pleased to know that's the sales pitch our side. Um, let's get to ready off. to, um, yeah, prepare to lift off as we start to take a bit of a deeper dive um, into um, the, the sort of 80 paid content strategies around the world. Is this where we have our wager? Yeah, I don't know if we're going to make it, so let's okay. give it as good a go as we can. Okay, we're practiced, but I think, you know, 80 paid content strategies in 40 minutes, we, we, have, um, we have realised we pushed it a bit. Obviously, we're going to, we're going to run through 
through all of the slides and we'll share those um, and additional content with all the learnings that we found throughout the research following the webinar. Okay, so we've got a bit of a global view to start off with, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, when we look at paid content strategies, I've certainly been working in publish for, publishing for about five years now. And with that, I've seen quite a lot of global change. Um, obviously, paid content um, was first established fully um, in the US with brands like the New York Times, um, Wall Street Journal, for example. And, and they're obviously miles ahead of um, a lot of the other territories in terms of innovation because of the length of time um, that, that they've been working. And the large print circulation basis that they started Yeah, with. absolutely, which is why we always look to these these publishers for, for sort of inspiration. One of your first um, clients? Our first clients, yeah. So it starts in the US. The UK uh, were quick to follow with the Times. We launched first paywall back in 2009 uh, for the Times, rudimentary at the time, um, but many, many publishers have followed this very established market in the UK um, with, with great results from uh, Guardian, FT, to name a few. Um, Japan has been a very interesting region for us of late. Um, obviously, we've seen developments whereby um, Nikkei bought FT, um, and have started to really sort of pull a lot of FT's content into um, their subscription offering. Um, they've had some really great successes. I mean, if you look at the volumes, they're up to, what, 540,000 digital subscribers. Um, now, this obviously is an international brand, um, and that's great. And obviously, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, these are all international brands, but the developments that we're seeing in Japan as an emerging market at the moment is that much more of the regional and more tabloid um, type titles are now starting to experiment and launch new services and we'll, we'll have a look at a few more of those as we go through the presentation today. Um, in Germany you started with the build but what other titles do you suggest people look at for inspiration? Um, well absolutely we can't we can't talk about Germany without looking at build because their development you know Axel Springer is the largest media group in Europe and the development personalization packages we're going to look at some of those further on in the presentation but absolutely look to people like FAZ where they are again developing an international brand um, if we look to um, people like Spiegel, for example, and even some of the regional publishers in Germany now are really making some solid moves in updated architecture and experimenting with, with products. Um, Scandinavia is great for us. We've had successes there, um, both in magazines and newspapers. Yeah. The belief is there that customers are more willing and accepting and value content greater. Yeah, I think there is a, a, a general acceptance that, that you know, they're willing, the consumers are willing to pay for content, but I think um, there's also a lot of a lot more sort of dispensable income and let's face it, for many subscriptions are a sort of luxury um, item or luxury addition um, and I think that's why we've seen more growth and more uptake in those regions where there's more disposable income. Even though their actual populations are smaller, they still get good numbers. Yeah, well look at Afton for that, 250,000 just pure play digital subscribers and that, that's obviously in revenue terms a, a massive win and that's just one publication. Um, obviously France um, has been a developing market, still a lot of changes here. We've got some interesting clients in France that are experimenting with micropayments. Um, again, we're going to look at some of those offers further on in the presentation. In terms of the developing markets, um, South America is quite keen for us, um, where the burgeoning middle class uh, in terms of device utilisation using iPhones and Android devices, that's increasing um, as their disposable income increases. And there's a perception there as well that actually reading valuable content um, is something of, of use within their daily lives and the same in Australasia. I think the other benefit Australian publishers have is that there's not actually that many of them. It's not a massively competitive market and one of them uh, is actually owned by News Corp. So they get a lot of their yeah. learnings from the developed markets yeah. which they can feed into their own. Well, it's exactly market. what's happening with um, Nikkei NFT, yeah. isn't it? shared learning. Yeah, absolutely. And then in terms of the actual developing markets, with the, we are a, Looking at this globally, you've got uh, the Middle East, where we actually do um, a news app for the Gulf News, and and we work with publishers like ITP in the magazine space. What's really interesting is that at the moment, they're all free, and the magazines have sort of extended their masthead brands nicely into events um, and content marketing. But until one of the papers maybe makes their move into paid content, yeah. Uh, which you're actually maybe yeah, seeing. Yeah, as yeah. you know, we've just launched offices in Dubai, um, so we're, we're having lots of engagement. I think in, in that region particularly, they're still just trying to understand the appetite in the market yeah. and what that business model should be. And then the final point in terms of the global views with, in Africa, where we've got a number of clients, um, and across that continent, we've seen an explosion in the adoption of mobile. Now, it's predominantly Android, 
Uh, and there are challenges with that operating system and with the people utilizing it because of pirating and copywriting. So to protect that pay for audience, which the publishers in that market are really looking to build, there's actually a lot of innovation that we're getting stemming from solving that particular issue. Yeah, and I think the, the other area with, with Africa is it's very, um, a lot of the transactionals are, are, are cash-based transactions still. Um, so, so things like sort of PayPal, e -wallets. so e-wallets yeah. aren't used um, as, as widely. As widely. Yeah. Um, so it's a difficult thing to do um, in, in Africa to understand how that's going to move forward. Um, but I think it definitely will. So what's inside our webinar? We've got eight topics, 10 ideas on each. That equals our 80 paid <laughs> strategies. Yeah. We're 10 minutes and we best better get rocking and rolling. Let's dig deep. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we, we just wanted to start um, with a bit of an overview on some of the market trends um, that we're seeing. Um, you know, obviously working with publishers around their technology stacks, um, I obviously get a feel for the RFPs and what everybody's interested in working on. GDPR was obviously a hot topic last year and that's meant the introduction of a lot more registration walls, whether publishers are charging for content or not. They're definitely pulling more data into the top of the funnel. Um, to learn from. To learn from, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, whether that's anonymous data from, you know, with platforms like ours with IND or whether that's registration data. That is also driving into the use of more dynamic paywalls. So now that we have the data, how do we use that data to, to acquire more customers? Um, so there's a lot of work being done around sort of DMP segmentation and, and having different experiences for users dependent on their, their that, engagement. That touches on the point which I found really interesting, which is the reduction um, and the restriction around meter counts for websites and for apps, the type of things that we build. And I heard on um, the excellent Media Voices podcast, which is produced here in the UK by Peter Houston and a couple of other people, that they had a, a leading digital guy from the Times on, and he was giving lots of really good examples that obviously we were pinching yeah. uh, because it was interesting. <laughs> but he was talking about the fact they started with a very hard paywall, now they've loosened it slightly. So if you give you, the Times your email information, they're actually giving yeah. you a, a couple of stories free a week. So they've loosened it. On the opposite side of that, you've got brands like the New York Times, which started yeah. very leaky coming in. Um, and yeah, and there's some benchmarking numbers around that now, which is that essentially your, your meter count um, should be set around um, sort of 5 to 10% of your average user's consumption. Because um, digital advertising hasn't been paying for those more anonymous users. No, no, no. no. And, and, and absolutely, if you, if, you, if you set it any higher, nobody's going to hit your meter count, so conversions obviously aren't going to be successful. So it's just a bit of a sort of current trend that we're seeing. So the logical next step from following on from that trend is then, why I think we're seeing so many publishers now offering that low, maybe in the States, 99 cent, but for a set one, min, one month minimum entry point. So you're actually starting to get people used to paying something. It's not much at the beginning, but it's shifting that psychological condition and perception that web content is free. Um, and for us, that's why the e-paper and digital editions are so important, because actually the perception of that is that it's a paid for product. There's a percentage of your customers that see something finishable as paid. Um, and that's part of this journey where publishers are trying to shift perceptions and help pub, uh, customers understand the, the value of paid for content. Yeah, absolutely. And then just a couple of other areas that I'd touch on um, to build around that. Um, like I said at the beginning, we've added basket functionality to support this pack personalization and bundles. We're going to have a look at some really nice examples from The Economist and Build and how they've started to integrate that into their acquisition strategy. Um, in addition to that, um, some of the other sort of things that we're seeing are around things like showing weekly pricing. Yeah. So not necessarily um, just a low start price, and that's that's a debate Again, we it's, can it's... have later. But 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 also psychologically, um, showing weekly price a bit of a challenge with some of the more sort of print focused platforms to be able to present that on the front end. Yeah. But if I can show a price point of a pound a week. Yeah. Um, psychologically. Um, it's better than fifty two quid a year to people. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So. Moving on from market trends. We're into office and incentives, aren't we? Yeah, and we've pulled quite a lot of different examples here. And I think the um, overriding message on incentives and offers is, is that we work with so many publishers, media houses around the world. Um, and the main point here is that you need to experiment, you need to be flexible, and you need to try lots of different offers and incentives because these are the areas where we really see the, the peaks in subscriber acquisition. Um, and, and, and there's a whole range of different offers. I mean, we've, we've kind of categorized a few of them here just, just to look at to give you some examples. And obviously, we're going to share the slides afterwards. 
Um, but there's some really nice examples yeah. we've pulled out. Well, I call it the golden triangle uh, for the third party collaborations, which is where customers one, publishers two, and advertisers three all win with those types of contras and collaboration deals. Obviously, the customer wins because they get a really nice additional product. In the case of the Telegraph, it was a Fitbit. And in the case of the publisher, they get most likely a full annual subscription and the opportunity to spend 365 days working on that subscriber for the renewal. And the partner or the advertiser works with the they get great increased exposure, maybe yeah. some free advertorial partnering on the content oh, side of things. Yeah, there's some really clever examples. We really, I really like the Lakeith version. It's one of our clients who um, are a sports national daily magazine, um, and they created voucher codes and printed them in the PlayStation FIFA games. When you buy the game, it offered you a free trial um, for uh, Lakeith, the sports national, um, if you sign up and register and give them their data. So these are types of data collection exercises and these really clever collaborations. That, that really have an impact. News publishers also getting savvy to initially it was called the Trump bump where there was an increased <laughs> subscription rate during Trump but obviously we've seen that during potentially during Brexit and other major political or cultural landmarks and publishers are working together to give complimentary access for their titles. So I saw it with the Telegraph and the Washington Post yeah. where you could get access to both those publications um, as part of the subscription, you've seen examples as well. Yeah, well, we just try to sort of play in a, you know, in a global webinar, we just try and play play in a few um, global examples. So Wall Street Journal and Weiborger, which is owned by Agora. Um, Again, around an election. Yeah, they had the election pack. Um, and obviously Financial Times um, and Nikkei are working very closely together. Um, but I think what's nice about these international news collaborations is that in many ways the international brands are ahead. They have a broader circulation. but it's pulling additional audiences um, to, to some of the more um, local and specific titles and adding value um, for users um, to their subscription. Yeah, we work a lot with regional publishers, to be, to be fair, uh, or at least in the States, um, non-national brands and in the UK, traditional regional publishers. And, um, you know, some of, the, some of the daily papers or the big multinational brands, you sort of look at their ideas and think, oh, well, how is this applicable to us? But simple things like contract term actually can increase the stickiness. I, I know that we sort of benchmark, if you can get somebody to subscribe annually to one of our apps or e-papers, the churn rate's only between five and 10%. You've you discovered this great example of NRC Handles Plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a guy called Javier Van Lu, and um, he's well worth researching some of the, the information that he's put out on Inma's websites, who's done a lot of research into data around the subscriber base um, and, and not so much how to just acquire customers, but more importantly, how to retain them. Um, and the findings from the research that has been done at NRC um, has been that actually the, the two-year subscription is their most popular um, offer or their most popular product. And interestingly, when you look at the messaging around the offer, um, what you're asked as a new subscriber is how long would you like to have the discount for? Um, so it's kind of psychologically when you're signing up for the subscription, you're committing to a longer term um, in order to get that discount. Um, so I think now, um, am I right in saying we're moving on to our poll? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have brushed over those slightly lightly. But what we'd like to do is, is run a poll question. We've got um, hundreds actually of, of publishers, product owners on this webinar. Um, and what we'd like to hear from you guys um, are what are the type of offers that are working best for you? Where, where have you had the highest um, level uptake. of customer yeah. um, uptake and acquisition? Um, so if you could vote and partake in the poll, we'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and if you can give us extra detail in the comments, we'd be fascinated to hear, you know, what are the third party collaborations um, that are working best for you? So we'll give it a few more seconds if you want to finalise your votes and then we'll close it and then we'll move on. OK, so interestingly, the free trial is looking to be the most popular so far and then quite a fair balance amongst the others. Yeah. So, so actually, what's quite positive is people are doing a lot of a lot of different things. There seems to be a range of ways in which people are utilising the available technologies, your platform, yeah. our products. I think it's part of that. And I think, you know, also, as, as product owners often tell me, they have lots of ideas around what they would like to be able to do. But maybe there's more free trials because that's easier to draw out Sentiment. and more would like to do personalized content but the, the platforms are a bit restricted so okay so moving strictly on um this is probably your forte ben um, it is so although the first point i remember you telling me quite a bit about with one of your us clients which is the subscribe with google um, and yeah, yeah i know it's only early but um 
you see it and publishers are seeing it as an incremental revenue stream rather than not the whole uh, yeah well i mean actually pie. subscribe with google has been quite a hot topic for us internally um so mccatchy certainly in the state are one of the first publishers to to start trialing subscribe with google yeah i have mixed feelings about it as a solution um i know if we look to some new york new york times yeah. who are very popular um they will tell you that they use every channel um because you know any any interest yeah. in any subscribers but obviously it. not all the data you're going to get with the subscribe with google you, yeah absolutely so with subscribe with google you're going to lose the data you're going to lose the direct customer relationship you're going to lose that insight but can you afford not to be on there so i think you know it's it's absolutely it's an additional channel you wouldn't rely on it solely but um, as publishers have done with social media which is the second point and then facebook's new subscribe product which again um a couple of our mutual what, mutual clients or your clients or our clients yeah. are, are testing and on but too early to say yeah, well, Facebook have published some reports to say that referrals um, <laughs> from the Facebook subscriber are, are, are causing an increase 17% more yeah. likely. Um, people are, consumers are 17% more likely to subscribe um, via this Facebook subscribe. But I think it's a, it's a bit too early to tell. But okay. I think, you know, as with Google, as with Facebook, <laughs> those channels are, are, are too big um, and have too great to traffic and pull not to be tested and trialed. So in terms of smart technology, smart speaker technology, we're developing on Alexa and we develop apps for Alexa and publishers are asking us ways in which to distribute content on those devices. With the rising popularity of podcasts as well, audio content seems to be important and you guys are looking at how to monetize that from a paid model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whether it's sort of audio, so we, you're absolutely right, we're looking at how we can um, process payments um, by our Alexa at the moment. Um, the but, most important piece of this whole channel slide for Patreon is, and, and perhaps for you as well, to be fair, is the iTunes subscription, Apple relaxing the way in which um, publishers can not only collect the revenue from iTunes, but collect the data on the subscriber, giving people the opportunity to create a account um, which they can then use to get complimentary access either within the app or on the publisher's website. If that subscriber who has utilized that easy one-click transaction through iTunes uh, then stays as a continuous subscriber for 12 months, Apple actually then reduce the amount of net revenue they take from 30 to 15. Out of all of the things there, that's the one that we see as making the most impact. Oh, yeah, and, and reverse bundling has always been a hot topic um, at MPP. So, so the ability um, for us to um, basically create um, a, a record for that user to be able to store information so that publishers can collect the data. And then remarket. Um, and remarket, yeah. Okay, so the next piece of our travels is the print. Yeah, and, and arguably many of you may ask why we're focusing on on print um, on, on, a, on a webinar about paid content solutions. Um, but actually this is, um, this is really important because um, I think what we've seen, um, certainly on the projects that I've worked on over the last 12 months, is that typically many publishers are still sort of treating print and digital as two separate operations. But if we look at your subscription revenue, we know that between 60 and 80 percent is still attributed to your print subscribers, these are your most loyal and engaged readers. Um, and actually, probably the biggest challenge is how you're going to transition those readers, sort of bridge the innovation gap left between platforms, between um, print and digital, and transition these readers, form new habits, drive them towards more of your digital products and services, potentially your e-commerce offerings. Um, so this has been a lot of development in our platform to enable that. Um, obviously, the, the easiest win here is, is to do the print and digital bundle, um, which we, we, we obviously see repeated quite a lot at the moment. But print in itself um, has the ability um, to really add value to your brand. Um, and, you know, we're back at the New York Times just because their um, example is so fantastic here, um, whereby they're creating um, limited edition or unique print products um, to build value into their overall offering. Um, in this case, um, the New York Times Kids Edition. Um, and we saw a lovely tweet. Um, uh, well, there's a couple of tweets here, but I saw a lovely tweet from a parent saying I was about to cancel my New York Times subscription. Um, and then you release this um, subscriber for life. It's a value add. Um, it's just building more value about that brand and what a nice experience, you know, for, for, for a sort of parent and child yeah. um, to get those children away from the screen. So for, for us, more on a more regional level, we've got um, pop-up papers like The National, which was born out of the Scottish referendum. Um, their bundle, they include an e-paper as a premium upsell, um, either to access the online or apps, and that's about an additional 30%. So 
even with brand new print launches, bundling in uh, makes sense for them. Uh, they've actually launched a Sunday edition as well, so things are going well there. Um, there's a weekly paper called The New European. Their editor, Matt Kelly, was actually on TV yesterday with Nigel Farage, um, and that was a weekly paper launched on the back of Brexit, and that's cover price. This is the interesting thing. It's gone from £1 to £2, now already at £2.50, and it's a bit of a badge of honour with the uh, Remain camp here in the UK. And again, you know, they launched it as a print product, but they bundled in with digital subscription. That includes the e-paper, and that's an additional 25 to 30%. So a nice little uptick. People utilising e-paper or digital editions as a way to generate and position that premium product. I mean, even Facebook are creating magazines now to drive digital engagement. So yeah. print is most definitely not dead, but you need a complementary strategy for subscriptions. On the flip side, we have digital only brands. And I know personalization has been important, um, certainly in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. So I've pulled out a couple of really nice examples here. Um, I hit up the um, Economist subscriber website the other day and had a look at the different packages on offer. Um, and what I discovered actually was it, regardless of the offer that I chose, I was going to hit this um, subscription builder site. And you can see the example of it sort of top top left of the screen. Um, essentially what you're going to do is each user is taken through a journey to pick their specific bundle. Um, so in this case we're looking at whether they're students, so which subscriber group they're in, what types of products they want and also the contract term. Hopefully by providing that personalised agreement users are less likely to churn. Um, but the we're bit, also... Yeah, on, sorry, I'll say in the bill do um, an interesting thing with personalization they're giving opportunities to buy different types of packages different types of bundles just the paper well, add-ons so add as well what we're seeing coming from the magazine industry uh, it's physical products it's additional magazines um but again all built into your build plus um subscription um so so more reason to tie you into to that contract and obviously yeah 400,000 digital subscribers from build so these guys are doing loads of great stuff the interesting thing for personalization for us is that building out products if you can increasingly serve relevant content to the relevant audience um you see an increasing level of engagement we've got apps and digital products in the market where you can favorite content or where you can have family different um, access um, from one family subscriber account. So mum, dad, kids can have different types of products. And then if you link in other technologies like push notifications, those can be personalised too. And it's all helping. It's all about that experience, isn't it? Yeah. So that overall and, and forming enough habits so that people stay engaged and, and don't churn. So the Guardian, um, the, the most interesting thing we found on here was the fact that the majority of their payments um, from their, well, it's not a subscription, is it? But the, the contributions that members can make, most of them are appearing to be one off. So although they're coming back yeah. into the black. Well, this is this is the news around actually the Guardian um, US um, subscription. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. 300,000 paying supporters. Let's yeah. not forget their supporters, not subscribers. Yeah. Um, but as you rightly said, 76% of those are one off donations. Um, so. It's not the same as recurring revenue. It's not the same <laughs> as recurring revenue. It's a massive win. And certainly if we look at Guardian UK as well, the revenue um, results so far have been brilliant. Um, but where will this go? How will they develop the membership? Um, so forward. that it is a two-way, because membership is quite different to subscription. It's about building community. Um, so how will that play out? Um, another so another key thing from Digital Only Brands is the kiosks. Uh, so... Um, Obviously, you can sell a kiosk type product um, in a number of different ways. One of the brands we work with in Scandinavia, Egmont, bundles all of their magazines, all 40, in a Netflix buffet style, all you can eat, one fixed price, access everything type model. They sell it to consumers, but the interesting thing, which I think other publishers could learn from, is actually the fact they, sell this, they can sell it white label to businesses. So energy firms, transport companies within that market who, who want to offer this content under their own brand um, to their own customers as a white level can pay the publisher a license. I think that's a clever way to go and similar in the way that um, publishers can utilise newspapers in education or maybe harness different markets in a different way. And we, you know, we've, we've got quite an interesting project with APA um, in, in Austria as well for, for the kiosk, which is an aggregated news content site. That's a micro payments model. Um, but essentially, it's, it's all of the publisher's content around Austria, but in an on-demand, very convenient form. 
um, and I'm seeing a real boost of other um, aggregated news content sites, um, probably because of some of the, the kickback against fake news, you get a more balanced view, but also it's a more convenient experience, you know, maybe it's an app form um, or, 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 or web form, but allowing people to, to view and consume on demand. The great thing with the kiosk as well is obviously if you own a geographic territory or you've got multi-title, you can bundle it all in and potentially price it above a single copy sale or above them. Yeah, or, or or aggregate sections together. So think about sport, lifestyle, cooking, etc. Which goes nicely onto your debundling one of your clients. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, we've got um, the Miami Herald, for example, who have launched a sports only supplement, um, just for sort of local sport information. It's very video rich. Um, there's a lot of um, additional um, insight into the games. That's their main draw. Um, but look at the price of it. Yeah. Not a point. <laughs> Was it eight cents per day? Yeah, but it's um, adjusting people's perception. It's getting people used to paying for something. And and I have to say, when publishers are talking to us about new products, utilising us either the digital platform or the app platform, centering it around something that's core to their market in the states. A lot of these cities have really strong sports communities. Also, food is a really important area yeah. where you can debundle the section. Well, they're content. interesting with the Herald. There've been a lot of offshoots from other titles who have kind of followed suit yeah. and, and created similar products. What's nice about debundle content is that you know when we talk about product development, we kind of assume we've got to build a, a completely new product from scratch. But actually, you've got this whole archive of information, and sometimes it's just being clever about the way that you aggregate that together, how you chop and change it, and how you turn it into a package that that suits a particular subscriber. Group. We're going back to mar marketing 101, aren't we, with the four Ps, price, promotion, place, and then finally with product in terms of if you if you build a nice enough place for these subscribers to be able to enjoy the specialist content, um, then they will reach it, uh, yeah. as some of these examples have shown as well. Okay, so we're now on to non-news, and there's a real um, diversity of options that we looked at predominantly because we actually did a whole webinar 45 minutes on this exact one, <laughs> one subject yeah, not too so long ago quickly because do you know what that paid content strategy is so prevalent yeah once you do start to, there's so many interesting topics so we'll do loads of off spit um offshoots and spin off bits of content around this the one we always have to talk about is the puzzle up though because it, how can you not because it's the highest you know, um, non-news product that we we can at exactly. least see in the market nothing yeah. to do with news yeah nothing to do with the core product um, but actually, um, <laughs> gross two million in revenue in the first three months, growing faster than the New York Times digital um, subscription. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and 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 like I said, just very clever brand engagement, debundle content. Um, and since that webinar, we've actually had a couple of other new examples come to our attention. So the first of which was the Telegraph Herald escape room. Um, but yeah, I've, loads, I've, loads. I've of done fun. one of these escape rooms. They're quite good fun, but they've they've actually made a good amount of money from it. Well, it's um, they, <laughs> I think it was just a bit of a quirky idea um, from yeah. somebody in the product team. Um, but essentially, um, yeah, they had three thousand visitors in the first three months. Each of those people were paying twenty five pounds <laughs> to yeah. access the room, do the maths. Um, it's a nice return. Um, and and it's quite clever really, um, because it, it you know it's, yeah. it's sort of tying in quite well with their their brand. The cleverest brand extension though that I've seen is the Time Out Market. I love that. I love the fact that it was it was a printed magazine, and now they've actually gone look, we are going to bring you the experience in this city, and they created this whole yeah. emporium in Lisbon. Yeah, You've been. yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Um, best custard. Portuguese custard tart I've ever eaten in my life. But yeah, 3.6 million visitors. This is now um, Lisbon's greatest attraction, um, yeah. if, you, if you're if you a sort of TripAdvisor fan. And you can see um, that brand rolling out across different markets. Yeah, as well. absolutely. So they're just going to replicate this in, in lots of different cities around the world. And, and the whole idea just spawned from a very clever product development team yeah. based out of Lisbon that saw the potential, um, but but the growth and the revenue is, is huge. On a, on a more micro revenue level, um, E-commerce boxes are being tested. I know. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to advocate. I'm a men's health enthusiast, but I've seen the magazine, and I know that they've got a food and supplements range. They're diversifying into that. Yeah, I think um, actually when we talk about um, paid content, and particularly magazine publishers and reader revenue. Um, the magazine industries are the ones that really need to hone in on the e-commerce capability. We're seeing some, some big changes there in terms of product sales, referral sites, um, you know, National Geographic, for example, um, or National Geographic Kids, 
um, looking at sort of gifting and adding educational toys in as part of a package for new subscribers. Um, but I think there's a whole range of opportunities where um, magazine publishers are um, advertising products um, to bundle those in, have exclusives and create revenue streams that, that can't be found elsewhere. Okay, you'll be pleased to know we are nearing the end of our Life of Fantasy <laughs> around the world. We've got two more to go. Subscriber groups, I love this. I love, we could talk about this we all day. We could talk about but this so, all but day. But headline, the headline news on subscriber groups is... Yeah, so I guess I guess the point here is we, we've looked at sort of debundled content, um, we've looked at all the different subscriber groups, it's the same thing, know your customer, understand your audience, create products and packages um, that work for them. But you don't have course. to you don't have to have a whole new editorial team to create new products. One of them one of the um, often neglected audiences digitally is actually the older readers and um, you may remember these people. These are the ones that have been buying your newspapers for years and years and years, and they aren't the millennials on Snapchat. They actually pay most of our wages, and they actually love digital content, and um, they are one of the highest users of some of the products that we bring to market. Um, so things like classic editions, where you bring to life maybe an important moment or a sports event or a thing of, of notice in your town or your city or your, your market, um, man landing on the moon, the, the time the Giants <laughs> won the Super Bowl. Yeah. You see massive peaks in engagement when you bring these types of products to this type of subscriber group, the nostalgia, yeah. the good times. Um, I, I really love some of the location specific examples. So yeah. we've quite a few of our clients at the moment. And um, so Irish Times, for example, are doing the um, overseas readers. Yeah. And um, so Irish Times abroad. Um, so we've had 24% increase in subscribers just over the past six months uh, for some of the offers around that. Yomori um, as well has just launched the Japan News. Um, which is an English version um, of the Japan news, which is popular in Japan for youngsters who are looking English to learn natives, yeah. English yeah. And, 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 and tied with business knowledge, um, but also uh, for people who want it in, in English language. And um, just really nice international packages that have been created there. I really like the Afton Poston Junior as well. Um, they've got this is essentially a, 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 a magazine um, supplement that's sent out. But, you know, it's already the ninth largest newspaper in the region and they have 30,000 subscribers. Not just that, but they're bringing kids in um, and getting them engaged with news at a young age. The, um, the week of doing that with the print, the print bundle, the, ad, yeah, the, the adults of the week and the kids yeah. the week, the Nat Geo are doing it. with the, You can buy the adults Nat Geo and the kids Nat Geo. Yeah, absolutely. And it's educational. And parents really like different formats that yeah. are available as well. I was talking um, to a regional publisher and they were saying they're actually thinking of trying to follow the FT's example and give complimentary access to maybe university students, yeah. filling up that funnel right from, from the beginning and um, seeing where that takes them. Um, the last thing that I probably would have said there was around uh, the family passes oh, um, yeah. and Spotify and Netflix. Effect. And, yeah. um, so I will take you back for one second, just because I think it's really important to look at how we pull in data into the funnel at the front end. And um, so like with Spotify, where you can have multiple devices, Clients like the Nietzsche are allowing up to five devices. Um, we have Sky now TV with four de devices. So think my family pass, not just the corporate subscriptions, but how do we pull more data into the platform by extending the number of devices people can read their digital subscription on? I nearly, I nearly put the hot air balloon into the air before you finished. <laughs> I was really making that leg by myself. <laughs> Ad blocking. Last topic. Okay. Um, is it? Is it? So the headline on ad blocking is for me it's um, with with brands like Time being bought by the CEO of Salesforce and investment banks saying subscriber based news products can go for eight to twelve times EBITDA versus advertising funded products going for four to seven times. Actually, you're building a more valuable business based on the reader revenue subscriptions. So ad blocking, yes, it's an issue, but if you move away from advertising as as, as your Predominant revenue. It's a safer so, bet. Yeah. It's a safer bet, isn't it, for publishers? It's definitely what we're seeing with the products that are being brought to market. But that said, there are ad blocking tools out there which people are using, and actually, there are some publishers. Yeah, just saying, those. So, Lakeep did the offer, and basically, they, 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 um, 
picked up if somebody had an ad blocker up, turned on when they hit the site and they started to build some rules um, around the meter that said if they had an ad blocker on to offer them a, a trial for the, the ad free version mm. um, that resulted in something like 27,000 new registrations just in a seven day period yeah. so it's just very clever use of looking at those technologies and how, how we can start to give those people yeah. a better experience based on their engagement and this isn't um, ad blocking but I love the Herald in Scotland where they offer an ad like so that they're, they're saying you know, um, don't you not necessarily to avoid ad blocking, but actually, we'll give you the content at ad light without yeah. hardly any advertising in it if you pay the premium. And they position that as a premium yeah. product. It bundled in it is the e-paper and the digital edition yeah. as well. But that's a really clever idea that I can see other people yeah. um, taking forward people as well. People love that. They want that. And then we've also got people like the Standard. Um, who have launched Pure with us, mainly out of um, some of the regulations that came out sort of GDPR. Yeah. That. But um, it's an ad-free, tracking-free subscription for a Pure digital product, and we've already seen that replicated with another publisher in Austria. It's going well. Yeah, it's got really good early results, um, and it's 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 really interesting to see how publishers are starting to embrace this ad-free model. You've got to have engaging content. Um, obviously, yeah. you've got to think about how, how how readers are going to stay and how you're going to retain them afterwards. But absolutely, ad-free is a safer bet in terms of a, a sort of secure um, future for publishers. Okay, so we're now back home after our trip around the world. <laughs> and did we, did, we make, did we make the bet? I don't, I don't know how many people are still 80? here. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think the sort of final comment, certainly from me and a, a technology perspective, um, is that there are so many ideas and so many opportunities in terms of paid content. Um, the only thing that res restricts publishers um, and product managers is the amount of flexibility in the infrastructure. And although paid content is, is now evolved um, and expanding and, and here to stay, um, many publishers still haven't fully invested in um, their futures in terms of uh, digital and the platforms that they need to be able to launch these offers and incentives in real time. I would, um, I would add to that, start light. There are lots yeah. of easy solutions, um, whether it's creating something from your archive, whether it's yeah. creating a very simple spin-off brand that doesn't need huge platform costs. Well, this is exactly why we started yeah. in the partnership together, really. Yeah. Sometimes it's just about repackaging content you've already got. Yeah, targeting a different user set, but maybe with the right price, yeah. maybe the right product, product that doesn't take millions of pounds worth of development, yeah. um, but get it in the hands of the right people, price it correctly, and offer them something unique and valuable, yeah. and you will generate some paid for revenues. So be adaptable, experiment. Um, so, least the, the the most pertinent question is where will you go next? And um, if any of you, well, we're going to Berlin, aren't we? We, we are. In a couple of weeks. We will be at um, one if we're together on stand. Yeah, um, and and absolutely, if um, paid content, product development, app development is your specialism, and you're going to be at the one if we're event in Berlin, um, we'd be delighted um, to talk to you um, and join share us together as we've sort of yeah. more formalised our partnership. And yeah, we'll. Me and Anna will both be there along with our MPP and Pastry colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. So come and talk to us about your projects and what your challenges are from a technology perspective. And hopefully we might be able to help you solve some of those.